I'd like for you to read with me verse 1 of chapter 2 of Matthew, just the first verse. Here we go. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now in that one verse, we have King Herod, we have King Jesus, and we have a group of men we have come to describe as the three kings, though they were not actually kings, but they're like us because every one of us has our own kingdoms. You have those things that are yours, that your stuff, your money, maybe it's your job, it's your realm, your kids, spouse, all kinds of things that make up each of our kingdoms. And so these guys weren't actually kings like we think of kings, but they had their kingdoms as well. So for the sake of the message, we're going to call them kings today because in their own world they were. And we dealt with, uh, three weeks ago, the vulnerable child king. We also talked about Herod back in October, I think it was. And in the picture of Herod, we saw how the world will try to stop God's purpose in his people. And we also could see how Herod was a picture of how we try to keep ourselves on the throne of our lives, ourselves, when the king of kings comes to take his rightful place on the throne of our lives. And as we looked at the vulnerable child king three weeks ago when Jesus was born, we saw how God gave him three things to ensure that his purpose would not be stopped in him, God gave Joseph and Mary direction. He gave them protection. And he gave them provision. Food for the road, you might say. And we saw how God gives those three saints to all of us, whom Jesus, we have Jesus as our Savior, and we're in that process of making him Lord of our life. And we come to our Father as children. Everyone that names the name of Jesus as Savior and Lord comes to God, receives direction for your life. Have you ever asked for directions and he given it to you? Protection. Sometimes we get into things that we shouldn't be in and and things come against us. And provision. The stuff of life for the journey of life. I want to deal with a group of men we call wise men or the three kings. So I would like us to read the whole scripture together now. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Here we go. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel." Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. First, let me give you a few basic facts here. First, we don't know how many of them actually came to see the child, Uh, Jesus. All we know is that there were three gifts. Also, they did not come until about a year and a half after the birth of Jesus. They came to a house, not a stable. 
They came in response to a star, which is probably related to a prophecy that comes out of the book of Numbers concerning a descendant of David. And with that in mind, I want us to see a picture that seems to parallel really a lot of people who come to Jesus and receive him as Savior and begin that journey of making him Lord of their lives. And I think this is a picture of a number of us here today, and we have either completed this journey or we are someplace in it along the way. There's a picture here of how people come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, and since that is the mission statement of this church, and you can go out there and look at it on the wall, it's right up there, to, to know Jesus as Savior and Lord and to make him know, it might be wise for us to acknowledge that this picture of how people come to know Jesus, not know about him, know him. First, these men came because they were intellectuals. They were thinkers. They, they were men of science. They had noticed an oddity in the sky and astronomical phenomenon, and through their studies, they were also familiar with enough religious and political history of the area, of their part of the world, to pick up on the possibility that just maybe something significant was happening in their world. And these men of knowledge and science and religion took a chance. They embarked on a journey to see if they could find the promised new king. They went to Israel and Jerusalem and because of the religious and political prophecies in the Old Testament. They came to Jerusalem and asked about the child and found that no one knew of the birth. They discovered enough in Jerusalem to get them to Bethlehem and into the presence of the Son of God. And that's how, what the facts of the story are. When they went from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it says that they were led by the star. And then it says, when they saw the star after it came to rest over the house, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, it's my opinion, and in my opinion, a dollar can get you a cup of coffee at, at Walmart or McDonald's. But it's my opinion, but it's also the opinion of a lot of other people out there that the star from Jerusalem to Bethlehem was not an astronomical star, but a messenger or an angel of God who led them and then settled above a particular house. Now, without going into a great deal about this, uh, let me just say that in other places, the messengers of God, the angels, are described as stars. In fact, uh, Lucifer was the morning star, especially in the book of Revelation. You'll see them described as stars or lights in the heavens. I think what we have here is the movement from an astronomical oddity to an actual heavenly manifestation for these men. That's my opinion. Let me stop there in the story and show you a picture of how people come to know Jesus. I find this is true of my own movement to a relationship with Jesus as Savior and that my job is uh, making him Lord of my life. Many people begin with an intellectual journey towards God. For whatever reason, they begin a journey. <clears throat> They're curious. God has put it in something in their life that is very real, maybe very practical or pragmatic, very natural, that begins to draw them to the proximity of his presence. A few ways this could happen. A person moves, ends up in a church in a new town. A person is curious about a particular church and shows up. A person is involved romantically with someone ends up in a church because of that romance. A person is curious about the Bible and reads it out of curiosity. A person is caught by something that is said by someone on TV and goes to look for an answer from someone who knows. And that person may be a pastor like me, but it could be somebody else. Two people get married. And they want to do it in a church and because it seems to be right. And so what they do is they end up in the context of that church. A person gets sick and seeks help through spiritual means, ends up in a church. 
A person is the child of a very spiritual person and is around that spiritual influence in a church over a period of time. There are all kinds of ways, practical ways, that people get into the proximity of Jesus in the church. Now, when they get there, though, they ask the question, where is this special other world, this spiritual presence known as God? They will ask that question, and most of the time, they don't find Jesus by just coming to church. You see, the church is much like Jerusalem is in this story. Going to church doesn't get you into a relationship with Jesus or with God. It only gets you close to that relationship. These wise men came from come to Jerusalem, and that's understandable because that's where you go if you're looking for the king of the Jews. And when they get there, they are amazed that nobody knows where to find him. People come to church to find God, and that's understandable because this is where you go if you're looking for God. And then sometimes they are amazed that nobody knows where to find him. Have you ever been in a church like that? Oh, God, I have. We have this mistaken idea that if we get a person into church, they will discover Jesus. And the fact of the matter is that we can go to church for years and years and never discover our own personal Bethlehem. That place where we encounter the Son of God and he is birthed into our lives. These men go to Jerusalem, and then, we, then they were given direction to Bethlehem, which was very close to Jerusalem, the place known as the place of the residence of God. And <clears throat> many of us go to church, and then we are given direction to the place where we can encounter Jesus, and we recognize his birth into our world or into our lives For many of us, we are like these wise men. We follow a natural phenomenon into the vicinity of God's birth in our lives. And then we are given some form of direction and we are usually led by a star or a messenger or an agent of God that leads us into the presence of Jesus. Now let me make this personal for some of you. I have, for a number of you, been that star, that messenger. Some of you have also been a star to other people, leading them to that place where Jesus is birthed in them, literally leading them to the place of the Christ so that they can enter into that relationship with him. Something natural kind of brings us to a church at times. And then usually there's an agent of God who gets us into the very presence of the Christ. And that is very supernatural. So these men were led by a natural star and then by a star that was some type of angelic phenomenon, a messenger that maybe only they could see. We don't know. There's another picture in Herod that the church needs to see. And by the way, we're the church. Sometimes the church is like Herod, and sometimes we are guilty of using people for our own designs and ends. Some people come to church seeking God, and the church says to them, in a sense, we want to maneuver and manipulate you to serve our design and our ends as a church. And we as a church need to continually guard against seeing people as a means to serve what we want to accomplish. Our action towards people needs to be continually judged by our mission statement, which is out there on the wall, which is on the top of your bulletin. To know Jesus, 
first to Savior ourselves and to begin that process of making Him Lord of our lives and then to show Him to other people first as Savior and help them make Him Lord of their lives. So we always have to be careful. We don't want to manipulate people. If new people wish to join in the mission that's, that we have, that's great, and we welcome them, but we're not supposed to manipulate people's lives to serve our agenda. And that's what Herod was doing with these men, and sometimes we can do the same. I want you to notice in the Scripture that when they got to Jerusalem for their answer to human hope from a natural phenomenon, they came to a dead-end street. As far as they thought that what was going to be there wasn't there. It was a dead end. At that point, they were given another point of guidance, but out of the stars in the sky, not out of the stars in the sky, but out of the scriptures. And with the scriptures, they found themselves going to Bethlehem. The same is true of us. When we get into church by natural means, uh, church is just another dead-end street, folks, until we find another point of guidance in terms of the Scriptures to get us to our own personal Bethlehem. Imagine these men. They've traveled hundreds of miles, and I can hear them saying to one another when they get to Jerusalem, well... Well, might as well go to Bethlehem. It's not far from here. It's only four or five miles. We, I mean, we've been traveling for weeks. We've come this far. We probably have done all this for nothing. But we might as well go on and go down to Mount Zion. It's that simple. Suddenly, they are guided by a star again. A miracle began to manifest itself in front of them, and they rejoiced exceedingly, it says. And friends, we will never find r real miracles in just natural things. Miracles come when we follow the word of God. The miracle of the heavenly guidance that was miraculous didn't start until they had come to the scriptures for guidance. And the fact of the matter is the same is true for us we will not get proper guidance or experience the miraculous until we begin to follow the scriptures. When they arrived, it says that they fell down before him and they worshipped him. And we need to get a handle on the Greek word that is really used here. These guys, they didn't kneel in reverence like you see in a Christmas pageant. These guys were not flat. The Greek word that is used here is what we would use if I were to take a glass vase and throw it up in the air and let it hit the floor and shatter into a million pieces. It is not an exaggeration to say that these men were literally broken into pieces by the presence of Jesus. That's what the word means. Anyone here who has really ever come into the presence of Jesus knows what I am talking about. And if you have never been shattered by the presence of God in your life and you don't know what I'm talking about, then maybe, just maybe today, I am your star. And maybe we can begin that last leg of the journey to your Bethlehem. The heavenly light that will lead you into that presence. These guys are not fanatics. They are studied men. They are schooled. They are reasonable intellectuals. They have come to find what they believe is the answer to the world's problem. And suddenly, they find themselves in the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but if you find yourself in the presence of God, it will knock you flat. In the presence of Jesus... These men opened their treasures. You know, it doesn't say that they came to give Jesus anything. They were just looking for him. But when they came into his presence, 
It was more than they had counted on, and they opened their treasures and began to lay them before him. They opened their treasures because they had encountered the glory of Christmas, Jesus. Now the parallel to us is that we come and we say, Lord, I have this treasure of gifts and skills, this treasure of talents and treasures that I hold that are part of me that you have put within me and in my hands. And for some who truly come into the presence of Jesus, this is what happens. You literally open up your treasures to him. I open my treasure to you, Lord. When we come to Jesus and receive him into our hearts, we are called sons and daughters of God. As sons and daughters of God, we are heirs to the kingdom of God with Jesus. And if you think about that, that makes us royalty. And I have been talking about kings and kingdoms because we all have them. We are literally kings and queens of our own realms. We are royalty, though, According to the book, the journey of these men is a picture of the journey of kings. And there is a picture here of our journey as well. For we are kings and queens in Christ Jesus, and he is the king of kings. The wise men are a case of people looking for an answer to the order in their own private worlds, and they are a picture of people who discover the transforming power of being reduced to worship in the presence of the King of Kings. And I want to invite you with me to look at your private world for a minute. The realm in which you live. Do you see the experience, in the experience of these men that the Lord is still looking for people who are wise enough to recognize that you are only going to find the real answer to order in your own private world by seeing and going after the king, Jesus. This quest that they are on is a quest for an answer to the problems of their world. Leave them there for a moment and come to where you're sitting right now, here today. And let me ask you, what is it that you're looking for? What are the things that are needed to resolve your personal disorder or imbalance or problems or stress or confusion in your particular world? And listen now, it doesn't matter if you have known Jesus for 50 years or six months or whether you are just close to that place where you're going to find him. The present challenge for each of us today is if we will truly seek him. If you do, you will find him and you will find him in him the answer to whatever it is that you are facing right now the questions of your life. I know that today I am talking to a group of people and you are in varying degrees of discipleship and belief and, and non-belief. I need to say this to everyone, no matter where you are on your journey in this life, the world will not give you the answer to whatever you seek. Let me say it again. The world will not give you the answer to whatever you seek. The world is a dead-end street, and the best thing you will ever find is Jerusalem, where logic tells you that the answers will be found, but it is at that point that you need to find the Word of God and let one of his stars, messengers, or angels in this world lead you to your Bethlehem for the first time, the second time, this time, where you'll find the king. And the picture and summons of the wise men in this message 
Whatever it is that launches your search for the Lord God, God will meet you where the natural process end. Because that's a dead end. And then he'll lead you to the one and only place where there is an answer for you. Whether it is that moment of salvation or what we're, whether we're talking about show you the help you need in terms of your present challenge in terms of life or situation. You know, we, we celebrate Christmas every year, but in this season, let us come and w- with our hearts wide open. As we end this time of this year, we don't need to be intellectually smart or educated so much as we need to be wise men and women. Let's let our hearts be shot through afresh with his presence in our lives. We don't need a pageant. We don't need a big church service experience. We need a fresh experience of the power of God through the work of the Holy Spirit as he descends upon us. All of us need to be be knocked flat by the power of God like these men were, where there is no explanation for it. Now that's my prayer for each of us as we come to the end of this Christmas season and as we begin to look at 2016, that the Lord will shake your foundation and shatter your comfortable religion or where you are right now. And that beginning today and through 2016, the Holy Spirit would breathe a fresh wind upon us and have things happen to us. Let's pray.